I, I, I don't have like.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Josie Foss, and I'm the executive director of the Robert Schockenbach Foundation. I want to thank you for joining us this evening for this virtual book launch of volume four of the annotated works of Henry George. This series, which will ultimately be six volumes in length, is published by Roman Littlefield Publishing and is sponsored by RSF with support from the Henry George Foundation of Great Britain. I'm excited about tonight's program and I hope you are too. We'll start with the series editors, Frank Peddle, Bill Peirce, and Alex Lau, who will tell us about volume four, which features Henry George's protection or free trade, as well as about the annotated work series as a whole, the motivations for creating it and how it represents a unique contribution to the scholarly literature. We'll then hear a lecture by our keynote speaker, Professor Brad DeLong of the University of California, Berkeley. Professor DeLong will speak about free trade in the 21st century and how it relates to Henry George's thinking on the subject. And we'll conclude with a question and answer period. If you have questions or thoughts throughout the program, please include them in the chat function. I'll be moderating this section of the program and I'll be looking there to share your thoughts with the presenters. So without further delay, I wanna turn it over to our editors, Frank, Bill, and Alex. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Francis Peddle, and I'm uh, the co-editor uh, with uh, William Peirce of the Annotated Works of Henry George. And I am also here with my colleague, Alexandra Lau, who has been uh, working as our colleague on this project from the very beginning. And today I'll give a general introduction to the uh, project that's been ongoing now for about six years. and. Uh, talk a little bit about the Henry George Corpus and uh, the origins of this project. And then uh, my colleague, Alexandra, she'll come in with uh, some details of a more specific nature and probably more of a historical thing because her, her expertise is in history and my expertise in philosophy. So I'm the, uh, I'm the idealist here in this whole project. And uh, Alexandra is definitely the, uh, the well-prepared scholar. So uh, the project itself uh, is a partnership between the Robert Schockenbach Foundation uh, based in New York and the uh, Roman Littlefield Publishing Group, uh, along with Fairleigh Dickinson University Press. And also it's sponsored by the Henry George Foundation of Great Britain. Schockenbach Foundation is a publisher of Henry George's work. So it's appropriate that uh, they uh, have uh, been the, uh, the key player, if you like, the key sponsor of this whole project. Now, uh, there are six volumes in the series. Uh, we're halfway through this series uh, um, up until basically pre-pandemic, and then things came to a standstill a little bit. Uh, so we've been about uh, two years getting the volume that this book launch is all about out, which is Protection of Free Trade. But before that, in 2016, we published our land and land policy. In 2017, we published Progress and Poverty, which uh, is George's most famous work. And in 2018, we published Social Problems. So the uh, series as a whole is projected to finish up fairly soon. Uh, we will have, uh, hopefully, uh, later this year, The Science of Political Economy, which is George's last work, published posthumously in 1898. And uh, following that in volume six, we'll have a perplexed philosopher, which was George's response to uh, the famous philosopher Herbert Spencer in the 19th century who changed his mind. And in changing his mind, he got George very upset about that. So that's a critical work. Now the series has scholarly contributions from uh, from eight scholars in the field and uh, the editorial team, which has been uh, Bill, Alexandra, myself, we've been uh, the ones guiding the project through, we're the uh, editorial management team, if you like. And we've also had some research support from uh, two universities. Now, let me go to the Henry George Corpus, which uh, is a significant corpus and uh, it was widely distributed in George's time uh, through uh, many, he, he published a lot of stuff himself, uh, which was typical then as it is today and becoming more so today. But he um, was uh, reprinted an awful lot uh, in many languages, Progress and Poverty uh, 
saw many translations and wide distribution in his own lifetime and has continued to be in the public domain uh, in a big way for uh, since 1879 when it came out. And all of these editions, though, these reprints and abridgments and so on um, are not really what we call in, in the academic world scholarly editions. They, you know, they sometimes when they got reprinted, they had uh, new prefaces, which maybe address some issues of the day and so on, but they weren't really scholarly introductions to the editions, nor were they um, editions that had annotations because George, you know, as you would expect, he's writing 120, 30 years ago. He uh, mentions people that are long uh, dead and very obscure. Um, and um, it's helpful to know who he's addressing in these things. So we've, we've done that quite a bit. Now, that is through EndNotes and other places in going over what, uh, what these references are to. And all the volumes have these critical annotations. Now, George's style is still pretty engaging. It's a Victorian style, but he's still quite readable. Um, and uh, he's uh, at times, as we say, pretty polemical. Uh, we've called uh, social problems in the previous volume his fighting book, but you can certainly say the same thing about the current volume that we're launching here today, uh, Protection of Free Trade. He was in the thick of all the major debates of his time because he was a journalist himself and he certainly knew how to take on the various pundits in the presses of his day. Now, the origin of the series, uh, I think, and I'll take a philosophical slant on this, uh, mostly apart from you know, the issues we do, we've never had with all these uh, reprints over such a long period of time, we've never had a critical edition, which to me is quite astonishing for such a significant corpus in the uh, American philosophical and economic and historical literature. But I also think, you know, since the great financial recession of um, uh, 2008, that uh, George again has come into the public domain in a big way. You know, there are articles, popular articles on him, for instance, one in Vanity Fair a few years ago by Kinsley, The Economist every now and then comes out for some very well, uh, written and uh, well-articulated arguments for him. He comes up in tax commissions and reports and uh, uh, with respect to the affordable housing crisis or the financing of public transit. So he's there kind of as the philosopher in the background, even if he's not that well known uh, in terms of the uh, public intellectual debates of the day. And I think uh, this is, uh, something that uh, will go on for quite a while. There's nothing has changed. If anything, the pandemic has made uh, economic inequality a greater problem. Um, uh, George, you know, uh, in his own time saw unearned increments of great wealth as having something morally really, uh, uh, there was a moral turpitude about it, you could put it that way. There was something deeply wrong with this and, um, inequality was certainly one of the things that he hoped to combat through his theories of how to get back into the public domain what had been in his view stolen from it by monopolistic capitalism at the time or you know privilege sort of exercising its power in the political and economic sphere and things of that sort so uh, what was a legitimate earned income uh, was an issue for him. And he saw a great paradox, of course, as much in progress and poverty as in protection of free trade between the growth of wealth, that is progress, and the um, concomitant or accompanying uh, uh, you know, spread, if you like, of poverty, both in an absolute and relative sense. Even though today we think of poverty is greatly alleviated globally because China's, you know, brought so many people out of poverty, but uh, we uh, we still see, especially relatively speaking, tremendous uh, poverty and uh, inequality in our society, and that ultimately is what George is all about. He's a protector of labor, and he thought, uh, and this is the issue in protection of free trade, he thought protectionism actually ultimately did not benefit labor as many people thought, 
but in the end, it really hurt labor and it hurt uh, working people anywhere, not just in the United States, but all over the world. So I will uh, leave it at that uh, and uh, hand it over to my colleague, uh, Alexandra, to discuss some of the other issues in this series. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alexandra Lau, um, also known as Alex. I've been working with uh, Francis Petal, Frank, and Bill Peirce on the annotated works of Henry George series, which is what this uh, book launch is here for. Uh, we just finished volume four, um, although volume five it will be uh, not far behind, and we're currently working on our final volume six, um, which we should hope to finish up soon. So um, I'm just going to say a few words as to sort of uh, why we, we did the six volume series, but also sort of our approach um, from an editorial perspective. And Frank had already mentioned this, but um, there really has never been a critical edition of George's works, which um, is really kind of surprising given his stature as an author, um, that someone um, as popular and who sold as many books as George in the 19th century shouldn't have a critical edition. Um, now, what is a critical edition? Um, it, it's essentially an edition that provides the uh, original text along with sort of annotations that explain um, what might be considered obscurities in, um, to modern readers, but that were well known in George's day. Um, now, some of our annotations, and we've put these um, uh, at the end of each chapter in each of the volumes. Um, now, some of them explain what, you know, to some well-read readers or well-informed readers might be um, obvious, things like who are the physiocrats or who was John Stuart Mill. Um, but many others, many, many others, I would say, really um, do provide insight into George's world and into his thinking as best we could um, determine. So to give you an example of one of those um, in volume three, we have an annotation that really explains and goes into George's friendship and really his identification with um, Thomas Nulty, who was um, Bishop of Meath in Ireland. So that note, for example, explains that George actually wrote in the standard which was the newspaper that he, he started and edited in the 1880s. So George wrote in that newspaper in one column that what was being called Georgism could equally be called Nolteism. Now that's something um, most modern readers wouldn't have, have known about George and his identification with Thomas Nolte or even who Thomas Nolte was. So that's an example of some of our, um, the annotations that really um, help explain some of these more obscure terms, references to people or concepts. Um, now George uh, was, I would say a, a fairly religious person or at least that's how we would consider him today. So he makes dozens and dozens of biblical references. Um, now, some of those, again, uh, well-informed readers, well-read readers will understand what he's referencing, but maybe more modern or secular readers may not understand. So we've annotated those references. Um, many of our annotations include hyperlinks um, where readers can sort of further their own, um, if, they're, if they're interested in that topic, um, they could they click on the link and find some more information. We've also included um, you know, additional sources they can consult. Um, each volume in the series also has an extensive introduction by a well-known scholar in the field. And these accompany, um, you know, these come before each of George's works that we've printed in these, in these uh, volumes. Um, these introductions themselves are replete with historical and conceptual insights, and they kind of help frame um, the discussion that George conducts or what's going to follow. Um, but they also delve into some of the contemporary issues and the controversies that really informed and inspired uh, George's writing. So one could look at these introductions as sort of a culmination of, of decades of Georgia scholarship and um, also a testament as to where the current thinking was about such fundamental issues that George tackles, things like economic rent, land value taxation, inequality, poverty, and the politics of normative economics. Now, at the end of each of our volumes, we've also included a pretty um, extensive index 
that uh, references not only to George's text, but also to the annotations and the scholarly introductions. Um, the last volume in our series, volume six, will include an extensive and up-to-date bibliography, and we've planned to uh, sort of organize this topically. So again, readers can really, um, who are interested in this, really further their scholarly interest. Um, and I think one of the last things we should note about this series, and this is probably what I've had the most <laughs> uh, hands-on um, aspect to, is that although George's writing was, was really high quality, um, we had to conduct a pretty thorough manuscript review of each of his works. So we would occasionally find errors or typos in the text and we would correct those. Um, and maybe for the sake of clarity and consistency, we sort of updated what I would say are some peculiar decisions George made when it came to punctuation or hyphenation, that sort of thing. But mostly we've, we've included the text as it appeared um, when it was first published. So we tried to make very few um, and only really necessary um, revisions or amendments to, to George's original text. And that's, and that's sort of what, how we approached this, this entire series. Um, and uh, yeah, and if, if, unless Frank has something more to add in terms of how we, how we the process for how we prepared these volumes, um, I think that's, that's about it, that summarizes it. Well, I think we'll just pass it over now to uh, my colleague, Bill Peirce, who will uh, discuss the, uh, the peculiarities of volume four and the trade debates of the 19th century. So thank you, Alex, that was great. The protection of free trade is, is fun to read. It's short, clear, witty, correct economic analysis, an important policy topic, the tariff and other trade barriers, uh, the main plot is that Henry George attacks the protectionist arguments using good solid economic theory, showing that trade is efficient and a nation will be better off with trade. And yet labor does not like imports. Why? Well, there's no perceived benefit. Uh, it doesn't seem that uh, labor is better off today than ancestors were many generations ago, at least in George's view, for the lowest group of laborers. Uh, skilled laborers do a little better. And uh, in addition, the, the emphasis in trade on efficiency uh, suggests to labor that uh, jobs will be eliminated. And for many in, in the labor movement and in labor generally, um, what is desired is not so much output as a job. And indeed, as George points out, with, under current conditions, there are not very many people that can create their own jobs. They're dependent on somebody to give them jobs. So what looks like to the economist, like a task to be done, looks to many people like a job with which one earns a living. Um, and George points out that uh, many of the gains from production go to someone other than the producer. And indeed he talks about the robber who takes all that is left. If you're, uh, if you're uh, walking home on a dark night and you fight off one robber with the uh, buy him off with a little bit, buy off the next robber with a little bit, but at the end of the road, there's always a robber who takes all that is left, then you don't worry about the earlier ones. So George's remedy for this is what he calls true free trade or the land value tax. And that's what Henry George was famous for, is devoted his book, Progress and Poverty to explaining this. Um, the, the, the tr uh, land value tax would amount to a, a single tax extracting land rents to the community use and providing ample revenue for services and a safety net. Um, a lot of people have, who haven't read George thought that he was an agrarian reformer with his emphasis on land, but that's not so. George was a city boy and he, uh, he liked the, the idea of the density of 
of uh, city population and services, the fact that you could buy or sell anything, and the efficiency of being able to do that without a long hike to the general store and the county seat. Um, and the bulk of the land value in the country, in fact, is in the cities. That's why apartment rents are so high, that the land values are so high. Um, so he proposed the, 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 the land value ta tax. And the advantages of the land value tax uh, come in part from the fact that it was a single tax. Uh, you get rid of all those other troublesome taxes, the tariffs, the income taxes, the sales taxes, and all of the regulations and restrictions that come with the taxing authority. Um, moreover, what's a little less obvious is that a, with a strong land value tax, the, the, the sales price of land would be driven down close to zero. And the implication of that is that it would be very easy entry for an ambitious, energetic young person with a good idea to start a business. He wouldn't require much capital. He wouldn't have to buy the land. He could rent it. Um, he would be able then to hire other people, and that would do away with, with the, the unemployment. Uh, and so he saw this really as a solution to a lot of the problems. Now, okay, so that's the main plot, but there was a subplot, and uh, the subplot reads, reads more like economic theory circa 1985 than economic theory circa 1885 when George wrote, and that was the government as a source of a lot of the problems. Um, the, uh, this begins, if you think of, uh, of a uh, tariff bill coming into Congress, and uh, the, uh, the, the metaphor that George uses is that you toss a tariff, uh, a tariff bill into Congress, and it's like tossing a banana into a cage full of monkeys. They're scraping and squealing to get at that banana, and uh, nothing real gets accomplished. The, the second problem is the is the uh, the lobbyists. And uh, uh, if you toss a tariff bill in his day, or maybe an infrastructure bill today in the Congress, then everyone wants a piece of it for his own city, firm, industry. And they're all they're scrapping for it. Now they may very well realize that the overall costs of the bill because of the inefficiencies introduced are greater than the overall benefits. But that doesn't affect the fact that if you have closely focused benefits, then the group that gets those benefits wants to fight for them, even if they realize that these narrowly, these widely diffused costs will be inflicted on them too. And uh, and then you get to the to the other problems of selecting government personnel. And George didn't think they would be the highest quality, but even if they are, how would they figure out which industry should be promoted and which should be allowed to to die, or which should products should we be permitted to buy from abroad? So he did not see he did not see. Uh, government as a as a real solution, although of course he recognized that his uh, government was necessary. And so what we are left with is that, um, uh, yes, George believed in free trade, but he wanted that to be full free trade, including land value tax. Um, thus, anyone able and willing to be a producer uh, could live well without the intrusion of big government, and that would diminish the wealth extracted from the producers by the other great categories of mankind, the beggars and the thieves. Thank you so much for that, Bill, Frank, and Alex. Um, just a note, the foundation is no longer located in Manhattan. We moved to Princeton in summer of 2020, so if you plan on stopping by, um, don't go to New York City. So now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Brad DeLong. 
Uh, he is a professor of economics and the Blum Center Economics Director at UC Berkeley. He's also an acclaimed web blogger at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth and a fellow at the Institute for New Economic Thinking. He received his BA and PhD from Harvard University. In addition to his career in academia, DeLong has served as an advisor on federal fiscal policy and international trade. He's perhaps best known for his 2012 paper, Fiscal Policy in a Depressed Economy, a work that's played a major part in persuading the Biden administration to go big. He's also well known for the scary debate over secular stagnation, which attempts to explain and expound upon the top concerns from economists like John A. Hobson, Alvin Hansen, and Larry Summers. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor DeLong. Please take it away. I well recall the day, wrote Henry George in his The Science of Political Economy. When, checking my horse on a rise that overlooks San Francisco Bay, much like this one, although San Francisco Bay looks very different now than it did back in the 1860s or so. The commonplace reply of a passing teamster to a commonplace question crystallized, as if by lightning flash, my brooding thoughts into coherency. And I there and then recognized the natural order. Yet at that time, I had never heard of the physiocrats or read a line of Adam Smith. I printed a little book. Our Land and Land Policy. A scholarly lawyer, A.B. Duthate, told me that what I had was what the French economists a hundred years before who had proposed. Henry George was here discussing what sociologist of knowledge Robert Merton called multiples. People thinking along the same lines, at first independently, but then discovering that what they knew or almost knew um, has been arrived at before, or is being arrived at now, or somebody else is hot on their heels. This is the, quote, deepest of pleasures, George wrote, looking inside himself, to hear of others who have seen a truth when you have seen a truth that others around you do not see. Henry George, born in Philadelphia, left school at 14 in 1854. A year later, he was in the Pacific on the sailing ship Hindu out of Philadelphia on its way to Melbourne and Calcutta. He would wind up on the Pacific coast of North America in 1858, where he stayed for 22 years. Only in 1880 did he leave California to write and speak and debate and talk in the North Atlantic intellectual sphere. In between, he was self-educated from his own observations and from the books that he found in the California in the 1870s context. This, I think, accounts for economists' relative neglect of George. He was always extremely happy to discover that he agreed with Francois Quenet or with Adam Smith or with Alfred Marshall, but he did not draw on them. Thus, all of George's works are written in an intellectual dialogue, a intellectual dialect, that is not quite economies. We economists recognize the ideas in it, but their expression seems a little unfamiliar to us. And so for points where we could cite Smith or Ricardo or Kenney or Marshall or George, well, we cite the orthodox economists because our dialect is directly descended from theirs. We just give Henry George and Francois Quenet, who is in much the same position, short shrift. Plus, there's the fact that George was definitely in the economist's face big time. Quote, political economies, professors and teachers have almost invariably belonged to or been dominated by that class, which tolerates no questioning of social adjustments that give to those who do not labor the fruit of labor's toil. They have been like physicians employed to make a diagnosis on condition that they shall discover no unpleasant truth. Given social conditions, such as those that throughout the civilized world today shock the moral sense, in the colleges and universities, is it any surprise? Um, it is idle to expect any enunciation of truths unwelcome to the powers that be." Unquote. And, quote, it is true, as Macaulay said, 
that if large pecuniary interests were concerned in denying the attraction of gravitation, that most obvious of physical facts would have had disputers." Unquote. But even though Henry George did not feed much into the currents of academic discussion, that led to today's discipline of economics. He did have enormous intellectual influence in America. It is a very important fact that progress and poverty had enormous rhetorical force in its day. A much more readable, and um, except for would-be professors in dusty rooms, a more convincing book than the works of the economists. Henry George Jr. claimed in 1905 that two million copies of Progress and Poverty had been printed. The best-selling book of the 1800s in the United States was, of course, the Bible. The second best-selling was Uncle Tom's Cabin. Ben-Hur comes, I believe, third, and I still find that not understandable. But Progress and Poverty is fourth outstripping the book that I think is number five, Edward Bellamy's 1887 very badly written utopian novel, Looking Backward. We know the impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Quote, so this is the little lady who started this big war, unquote, goes the apocryphal story of Abraham Lincoln's meeting with Harriet Beecher Stowe in 1863. Bellamy, um, Bellamy had an impact. George, George had a bigger impact. One of the interesting puzzles in North Atlantic political economy around 1900 is that the United States had a progressive era, but Great Britain really did not. In the mid-1920s, John Maynard Keynes, in his pamphlet on the end of laissez-faire, pointed out that most of British public discussion about economics was based on a general belief that economists taught or perhaps should teach laissez-faire, shrink the government in a bathtub and then drown it, as a general rule. And Keynes pointed to the extraordinary reach of Jane Marset's Conversations on Political Economy and Harriet Martineau's Illustrations of Political Economy in creating that belief. America had George and Bellamy as the mass market writers on political economy, Britain had Marset and Martineau. It is not stupid to think that perhaps that made um, the difference. We here, we here are not here, however, to talk about land value taxation. We are not here to talk about Henry George's role in trying to advance our democracy by lobbying to institute the secret ballot. Jill Lepore, though, of Harvard, says that we owe it more to him than to anybody else, that we have it. We are here to talk about protection, tariffs and quotas, or free trade. So let us start by listening to Henry George about how in arguing for free trade he is swimming against the current, rolling the Sisyphean stone up the hill, for he finds himself in very bad intellectual and moral company in being a free trader. In America, um, the advocates of free trade before the Civil War had overwhelmingly been future Confederates, very strongly attached to their natural right to sell tariff-free to British factories and thus collect every possible cent from the cotton they sweated out of their slaves with the lash. And in America after the Civil War, the advocates of free trade, as Matthew Downhower quoted George in an article that he wrote for Liberal Currents just last week, um, yeah, George said that the advocates have, for the most part, not only professed no special interest in the well-being of the working classes and no desire to raise wages, but have denied the justice of attempting to use the powers of government for this purpose. The doctrines of free trade have been intertwined with teachings that throw upon the laws of nature the poverty, responsibility for the poverty of the laboring class. 
and sponsor a callous indifference to their sufferings. While protesting against restrictions of wealth, they have ignored the monstrous injustice of the distribution. And let us start by listening to Henry George on how tariffs are in fact an act, I mean, you might call it economic war, but an economic war waged by a government against its own economy. Quote, trade is not invasion. It does not involve aggression on one side and resistance on the other. We say the United States forced trade upon Japan, but what was done was not to force the people to trade, but to force the governments to let them. Trade does not require force. Free trade consists simply in letting people buy and sell as they want to buy and sell. It is rather protection that requires force, for it consists in preventing people from doing what they want to do. Protective tariffs are as much applications of force as are blockading squadrons, and their object is the same, to prevent trade. The difference between the two is that blockading squadrons are a means whereby nations seek to prevent their enemies from trading. Protective tariffs are a means whereby nations attempt to prevent their own people from trading. What protection teaches us is to do to ourselves in time of peace what our enemies will seek to do to us in time of war. There it is. Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman called that the most rhetorically brilliant argument for free trade ever. I suspect that Friedman was less pleased for what came toward the end of the book. For there, George cautioned, What have we proved? Merely that it is the tendency of free trade to increase the production of wealth. But from this, it does not follow that the abolition of protection would be to have any benefit of the working class. The tendency of a brick pushed off a chimney top is to fall to the ground, but it will not if it is intercepted. Milton Friedman believed to his dying day that anything that increased the productive powers of labor did augment wages, unless government regulation to establish and maintain monopoly power in the economy interfered. But Henry George disagreed. He saw, in fact, existing conditions that were preventing the working classes from gaining the benefits of this tendency. In fact, George said, even the claim that freer trade is good for the working class, that was made only in countries that were at least semi-democracies. In countries where the working class had little or no political power, they did not even bother. Um, and all this posed a deep and serious problem for free traders. As George wrote, the problem we must solve is to explain why free trade, or he said other things like labor-saving invention, fail to produce the general benefits we naturally expect. It is a problem of the distribution of wealth. When increased production of wealth does not proportionately benefit the working classes, it must be it is accompanied by increased inequality of distribution. In saving themselves free from trade and labor-saving inventions, um, they do not by themselves tend to inequality of distribution, yet it is possible they may promote such inequality. Now, as we all know, George's solution was the single tax, the unimproved land tax. The root problem he saw was people who took without working by means of control of resources that no human had made. The solution was to take those earnings that were paid not for human effort, but for natural scarcity made actual, and that were charged a price for the marketplace, and then to take and recycle those earnings back to the people. That way you would equalize the distribution of wealth, but you would not have to do anything to interfere with the market economy's ability to send people signals that they should do what would actually benefit the economy as a whole by producing things that were valuable at a resource cost that was as cheap as possible. <clears throat> now, um, 
Henry George was 100% right in identifying this as a big problem with free trade. Wolfgang Stolper and Paul Samuelson, writing in 1941, is now the standard reference for us economists. Consider, they said, a trading economy in which there are two countries, each of which produces the same two goods, call them food and crafts, both using two factors of production, labor and land, with food being the more land-intensive good. Labor will be the relatively scarce factor of production in one country, and it will be the relatively abundant factor of production in the other. A reduction in tariffs, they proved mathematically, assuming the economy is in a competitive equilibrium, will raise wages in the country where labor was the relatively abundant factor, and in which freer trade will raise exports of labor-intensive crafts goods. It will, however, reduce wages in the country where labor was the relatively scarce factor by subjecting their craft work sector to foreign competition and reducing the price of craft goods and so giving workers in the agricultural sector less of an ability to threaten to exit when landlords cut their wages in order to collect more in rent. Now, as um, Danny Roderick likes to point out, um, the distributional effects from trade policy, they swamp the production increasing effects. Although the production increasing effects, don't get me wrong, the production increasing effects are still there. And so um, freer trade can raise worker wages only if it diminishes the market social power of the workers of non-labor factors of production. And that, by necessity, can be the case only half the time. Yo, know, Henry George was right. Moving toward freer trade increases the amount that can be produced by a well-functioning economy. But Henry George was also right. Increasing, freeing up trade can increase inequality. And that increase in inequality will swamp the effect on workers' wages of increases in um, productive power if it goes the wrong way. And by necessity, it can go the right way for owners of labor as opposed to owners of capital and land. It can go the right way you know, only half the time. Now, um, you can soften or you can harden you know, this conclusion by bringing in other considerations. First, a market economy is a tremendously effective societal calculating and organizational machine for crowdsourcing and then coordinating solutions to the problems that the market economy sets itself. That, in fact, was the genius of you know, Austro and British Chicago and a moral philosopher Friedrich von Hayek. It was his genius to most clearly see this. But you know, what Hayek did not see as well was that the principal problem that the market economy always sets itself is to maximize the satisfaction of the desires of those who own valuable property, like land, to provide them with the greatest amount of the necessities, conveniences of luxury and luxuries of life that the rich or those who own property that is worth something. Um, think that they need. If you have any other goals and the convenience of property owners, the market economy will satisfy those other goals only as a byproduct um, of satisfying that first one. And third, in particular, thus the market economy by itself will not be very good at generating rapid economic growth. It'll generate current wealth for the rich 
it won't necessarily provide for the future. For one thing, the rich who own valuable property, um, they may well not think long term. They may well be likely to be shorter sighted. They may prefer to live well by importing foreign luxuries than to divert earnings from exports to importing technology embodying capital goods or otherwise investing to produce to boost production. Um, after all, their lives are short. Um, they know that politics is complicated. Um, why not, you know, you only live once, um, after all. There's nothing in the market economy that is a strong voice for the future. The unborn cannot show up to buy anything now, and thus you have to trust on speculators willing to take the long run. And when are speculators ever willing to take the long run? Um, in order to store up the potential to produce in the future um, for the benefit of those who cannot today make their voice known in the marketplace. B, um, the market does not really see the advance of technological knowledge, either in blueprints or such that are only imperfectly turned into property by patents, or in the tacit experience of communities of engineering and organizational practice that learn by doing and from experience, which cannot be turned into property you can buy or sell or get rent from, you know, pretty much at all. Right? That what the market cares about is will a rich person pay a lot for it? That's what it tries to produce. And there's no way a rich person can pay a lot for a well-functioning community of engineering practice because once it exists, they then cannot control it. Um, for C, um, another reason for, let me give you another quote from protection or free trade. And that inequality in the distribution of wealth tends to lessen the production of wealth on the one side by lessening intelligence and incentive among the workers. There is a point at which increased inequality of distribution will neutralize increased power of production, just as the carrying of too much sail may deaden a ship's way. Of course, um, of course, a democracy um, or any other kind of political society, it's not likely to be terribly happy with a market economy that ruthlessly crowdsources solutions to the problems of making the rich as comfortable as possible and then ruthlessly implements those solutions. You know, people demand more than just the elimination of all rights that are not property rights and the devaluation of those property rights that are not necessary to produce things for which the rich currently have a serious Jones. Um, have that be what a market economy produces, and that is what a market economy produces. You know, people won't be happy. People think they have other rights than property rights. People think they have a right to stable employment, that their job and their ability to quickly get another equivalent job if their old jobs end, that should not be hostage to their region and their industry passing some maximum profitability test administered by a group of financiers thousands of miles away. People think that they have a right to an income level they deserve by virtue of who they are and how they played by the rules to get to their position and that the economy needs to be arranged to provide you know, that level of income. People think that their community is in some sense theirs, and that the economy should be arranged to shape it to their liking. You know, people, in a word, think that society should be just, although do note that that's not a transcendent justice, that's a kind of local current organization of society just. Um, 
justice. Um, the just society that people look for may have nothing at all to do what we today think of as egalitarian social justice. After all, as Plato defined it, justice involves in treating equals equally and in treating unequals unequally. And if you have a society where there's a substantial group of people who have a very strong feeling that there are others there who are unequal, kind of egalitarian, what we would call social justice efforts, they will see as being not just as all. Now, confronted with this problem between what the market economy does and what people want, um, Friedrich von Hayek had a hard piece of advice to give. Um, he was, do not ask. The market economy can produce, it can produce a lot, but if you start asking it to distribute fairly, you'll go into a swamp and you will never get out. Um, you know, you cannot pre-distribute or redistribute the income distribution that the market economy throws up as a byproduct of its maximizing the ability to produce without destroying prosperity. And Hayek said, without destroying freedom as well. But as Hungarian Jewish Torontan moral philosopher Karl Polanyi stressed over and over again, the market economy turns land, labor, and finance into commodities to be moved about to satisfy the maximum profitability test. People do not like that. People react. There is absolutely no point in telling them that they should not react, that they should not object, um, that they should simply sit and believe, take what the market gives them. Now, ever since political economy began to divorce itself from its fundamentalist utilitarian Benthamite roots, that all economic arrangements are damned if they do not produce the greatest good for the greatest number, it has tended to fall into an equally hard-line fundamentalist position. But what on the other side? You know, what is that position? It is that questions of distribution are questions of value that are beyond economics' scope. That economics is concerned only with efficiency, and after the things that hobble market efficiency are taken away, then all that an economist can say is, quote, the market giveth, the market taketh away, blessed be the name of the market. In large part, I think, because Henry George was offsetting his thought in its intellectual concrete pattern in San Francisco, he escaped this tendency. Instead, his watchword was always, the market was made for man and not man for the market. That point of view has very powerful virtues. Milton Friedman told you and I tell you, Henry George's protection or free trade is still well worth reading. It is not just because it remains highly readable today, if you can get yourself into a late 19th century dialect reading frame of mind. It is because it is very smart and engaging and interesting. It is a sign of a serious and brilliant mind I'm wrestling with a hard problem. And it is because it never forgets that the market was made for man, not man for the market. Milton Friedman told you, and I tell you, Henry George's protection or free trade, as well as his progress in poverty, they are all still well worth reading today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Brad. Um, and I'm gonna ask all of our panelists to go ahead and unmute and turn on your cameras. We're gonna start the Q&A um, and we've got some interesting questions that uh, have come from our audience and I'll be posing those to you now. So the first one, Labor needs jobs because labor cannot exist without income in a monetized economy. Does George engage with this, the role of money, or does he dismiss it as secondary? 
And I well, think I anyone think, of you can take that. I think George worries a lot about this. Um, remember, he had spent his formative years in California um, from 1850 up, up to 1880. And so what he is worried most about is whether people have an option other than to find some boss who they then have to go to beg for employment. And so he is working in a world in which he thinks that there is lots of available land open to people to settle on and to farm. And the big trouble is that big institutions, railroads, land barons, governments that are grinchy with their land policy, um, are not giving people an out, um, are not giving people an option other than to become a wage slave. And, you know, that is one reason for the single land tax. It will make it no longer economical for the big guys to hold on to the land. Um, and I suppose that if you asked him today, he would do what a great many Americans did with the closing of the frontier around 1900 and shift from talking about opportunity as existing on the land frontier to opportunity as existing on the technological frontier. Um, and I think he would very much admire and applaud the coming of technologies that would allow people to work for themselves and find their own audience and set of customers for what they're doing without the intermediation of large actors that act as rent-seeking robber baron choke points in the economy. I don't think that George worried particularly about about money, that uh, money facilitates trade. And he was more worried about the, uh, the mm -hmm. big problems, the, the monopolization of land. And he also attacked other monopolies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In any time he sees someone who is not working and yet is collecting a lot of money somehow via ownership of something and some market position that gives them the advantage. He gets extremely angry and thinks something needs wrong and that very much needs to be stopped. Yes, uh, Frank, Alex, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, not, not at this point, I think. Uh, okay. I'll, pass on I'll, move, I'll move us to the next question and this is a long one. So listening ears. Uh, regarding population density or urban densification and the LVT, it seems that a century and a half ago, this argument may have had more resonance. But since then, it seems the world population has become overly crowded in urban centers and metropolises. Is the densification argument slash advocacy outdated, particularly in light of COVID and our capacity to build high rises, which did not exist in Georgia's time? All buildings were low rise. Well, I'd like to jump in on that because we are getting some interesting work now uh, done on the relationship between the distribution and privatization of economic rent and its effect on the price of urban space and its coordination with uh, the epidemiology of the pandemic. And uh, now there was an earlier book that looked at this in terms of George, maybe about 30 years ago by Miller. And we're now getting uh, some studies on the pandemic as well. I think George, in terms of the, uh, you know, the urban environment, we're obviously a much more urban society. Only it was only like six or seven years ago that the whole planet became 50% urbanized, as they defined it, living in a certain metropolitan area. And uh, uh, you know, most countries in the West are, you know, Canada, for instance, we're over 80% urbanized, and it's the second largest landmass in the world. So it's pretty amazing. And uh, you know, George was principally, I think, an urban economist. He was, he was not, a, as, as Brad sort of pointed out, he was not an agrarian economist. That's one of the unfortunate things about the land tax, right? Everybody thinks it's a tax on farmers or something. And uh, so I think the coordinations between the price of urban land uh, and uh, the distribution of inequities in terms of health and education is an extremely important theme that people, uh, and if there are potential um, applicants to your research program should start looking at in greater detail. And there is some more interesting work being done on that right now. Okay, 
Uh, free trade is opposed for two reasons, to preserve local jobs and to force rogue countries to adopt social justice. Did Henry George ever make this distinct distinction? Hmm. Um, I don't think he ever thought that protection might be used as um, a weapon for social justice. That is, I'm trying to think of examples in which it was used. Um, you know, I mean, the, um, it was certainly tried to use in the other direction. That is, during the Civil War, the Confederacy very much um, wanted the um, British government to enter the war on their side in order to end the Union blockade of cotton exports from the South that was depriving Britain's Lancashire factories in Manchester or elsewhere of cotton for them to spin and causing mass unemployment there. Um, so that to the extent it was an issue back then, the polarity was somehow reversed. You know? That is, it wasn't that countries were thinking about boycotting bad guys. It's that bad guys were thinking about offering their goods for sale as inducements to win allies. I would just jump in and, and say, agree with yeah. that, say that, um, you know, it wasn't as though our, our labor protections were all that great at the time oh. of writing. <laughs> so um, I don't think that was entering his mind in terms of what other countries were doing, at least if that's what the uh, question was in regard to social justice as to, you know, right. better protections for laborers in other countries. I mean, this is an age in which the liberal president, the liberal president, Grover Cleveland, um, deals with a railroad strike by attaching a mail car to the back of every single train so that any attempt to at all block the movement of railroad cars through Chicago um, is a felony because it's interference with the mails. Wow. Okay, next question. Can we have a land value tax while acknowledging our cities are currently too dense and can contain too many high rise condos resulting in an unsustainable and unhealthy environment, not even green spaces, et cetera? You know, the, the other side of the high density in urban areas is that there's more room outside the urban areas. It's not really clear what is so unsustainable about uh, high density cities. I guess we have lots of experiments now in, uh, in China with uh, many high density cities. Um, it, it, you know, the peculiar circumstances of the pandemic may have caused people to re examine their feelings for, for density, but um, wait two or three years and you, you may find the preferences have shifted back in that direction. But uh, land, land density too is a function of price. I mean, the, the degree of intensification of a site in an urban area is a function of price. And in a market economy, of course, you're gonna get higher buildings. I mean, you, you buy a piece of land in New York, it's, it will demand a higher building, right? If you've been in China, you can go down a road in, 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 the, urban, in the rural countryside and see a 40 story building, but only a command and control economy would do that push it in there. I think George's view is that if you got, uh, uh, you know, a more, uh, you know, um, that land pricing was more uniform within an urban jurisdiction, that the buildings as a whole would be more uniform. I mean, you go into any, you can go into New York and find a vacant piece of land next to a 50 story building. And that's true of any city in North America. And, uh, you know, what's wrong with that picture? That's, that's what, you know, Georgians will want people to ask. Yeah. So why do you think George fell out of favor and is he poised to become particularly relevant in the modern day? Um, well, at least my take on that was that his ideas got cemented into form during his years in California from 1858 to 1880. And then he went back to New York and he began crossing the North Atlantic to give lectures and advocate and so forth and run for mayor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when he did so, when he ran into economists, um, he was always very pleased to find in economists 
ideas that he had thought of himself out in California looking at land values in Sacramento and San Francisco and making sense of it. And so he never, um, he never really spoke economies. That is, we economist types can recognize that George has our ideas, but he doesn't express them as Adam Smith or John Stuart Mill or Alfred Marshall, or indeed as Paul Samuelson would. Um, but still, he does have insights, like the big insight in protection or free trade, that yes, free trade manages to promote production and increase total wealth, but the key thing is always that it has effects on distribution, that it's in figuring out what those effects are distribution are, that you have to look at to understand its effect on the economy and the politics of it. You know, this was going to be one of the things that when Paul Samuelson and Wolfgang Stolper did it in math in 1941, they were incredibly, incredibly proud of what they had done, of showing that movement to free trade in a two country, two good, two factor of production economy can only raise wages in one of the countries. Um, and yet that was something George would have been talking about 60 years before, but not in terms that immediately resonated with economists. And so when we cite someone, we cite someone who talks our dialect and George is off talking his own. I think that may go far to explain why uh, George is not quoted by, by economists very often, but um, he did have a powerful influence on, on the public policy process. Oh, yes. Discussion. Oh, yes. Oh, and, yes. Uh, but his, his, main, his main argument that we should go to land value tax and other ways of cap capturing monopoly rents, mm -hmm. um, he got I think got lost, and I, I think uh, Alex has done some work uh, on that, on what happened uh, to the uh, uh, in the tariff arguments and afterward. Um, so no, but I think the influence was long lasting. Um, I really do think that in America, that if you compare America and Britain and what was here the Progressive Era, um, and indeed up through the 1920s and into the 1930s. In Britain, because of who the popular writers on economics were, I mean, you very much have a sense that the market is a god to be worshipped, that even the Labour Party government in Britain in 1930 is desperate to follow orthodox finance and stay on the gold standard, because, you know, that's what they've read and that's what they've been taught, that kind of the big 1800s books on economics that were actually read by real people were kind of conversations and illustrations on political economy by Jane Marset and Harriet Martineau. While in the United States, you had Henry George and fairly close behind him, you had Edward Bellamy um, with his socialist utopian novel, Looking Backwards from the year 2000. And I think that very much made American public discourse much, much more open to populist and progressive ideas and much more prone to believe that the market should not be worshiped as a God, but instead considered to be a servant who needed to be properly trained to do his job. I would just add, you know, you, you mentioned Brad that the British didn't really have a progressive era like we had in the United States, um, but they sort of did. It just came after World War One. Yes. And yes. it was much more far reaching than our progressive era was. Now they had more of a socialist era, I would say, at the time that George um, was writing and very popular and, and they were pulling from the socialists that were pulling from Henry George over in Europe and in Britain. Yeah. And that's where they started to, to understand that not everything belonged in the marketplace. And they were really learning that lesson from mm -hmm. George. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, their progressive era was more of morphed into a socialist era and then into the huge reforms they passed after World War I, which were much more far reaching, but were very similar yeah. to what the progressives were trying to do in the United States. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've always liked, you know, um, Leo Tolstoy, right? Leo Tolstoy saying that Henry George was the greatest American of the 1800s. You know, that's kind of very much a sign of his global reach and of his influence back in his day. So we are um, 
a little bit past time, but this is a great discussion. And there's some other wonderful questions that I'd like to pose to you guys, so to the panel. So if you're game, um, mm -hmm. we'll stay on for the questions that we have. Is that okay? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, is George's view of money relevant today, given the role of the central banks in the Great Recession and the extraordinary events of the past year? Well, George didn't say a whole lot about money. It's, it's very embryonic. I think it's, if he basically talks about it as a medium of exchange and as a measure of value. So if you're going back to George, uh, say in the last book of the science of political economy to find a uh, modern theory of banking in that, well, forget it. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's much more a real side um, that is opposed to people like Milton Friedman who blame the money system going wrong for depressions and high unemployment as episodes. George is very much, it's the derangement of production caused by the fact that the wrong people are earning the income and then they do not have incentives to spend because they have too much anyway and are already all but satiated. That is the cause of high, periodic high unemployment. Um, so it comes at it from a completely different angle and it doesn't very much engage the kind of monetary theory, literature and ways of thinking at, at all. Uh, you do get some some beginnings of a monetary uh, of a banking theory yes. of, the, of the real estate side. Yes, yes, and, yes, but, yes. But you can't banks uh, that loan banks that loan money to people who allow them to buy land, yeah. which then contributes to the concentration of land, and then haha, we're off and running. Um, that the banks and the financiers who do this, especially those who are. Um, gambling on future railroad subsidies uh, to allow the construction of railroads to make that land valuable in the future. Um, the speculation nexus and the role of banks in assisting that is something where George has things to say. You know, quick, just very quickly, he, he is, he is a uh, interesting uh, canary in the mind though about mm -hmm this issue of commodifying money. You know, everybody's trading money around today like the same way they would trade a bushel of wheat or pork bellies. And, and one thing George really emphasizes, look, get back to just seeing it as a medium of exchange. And don't treat it as sort of a capital item. Right? And I, I think he's instructive in that sense. So this is an interesting question. How does Henry George's view on work compare with contemporary, contemporary disability discourse? How can someone who cannot work hard because of their disability have a good life? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think that uh, George would have, uh, would have uh, put him out to pasture uh, just because he's disabled. Uh, that, but uh, George really believed that, that most people with working age could work if the jobs were available or if they could create themselves a job. And that's what he was looking at. And that's, that's sort of the bulk of the world, not, not the, uh, the handful of, uh, of people. Who and, are and, our brain, and the problem is always crafting the job to the person rather than requiring the, the person fit the job. You know, that our brains are remarkable, remarkable instruments. The equivalent of supercomputers, we cannot yet build stuffed into half of a bread box and drawing only 50 watts of power. When, in, say, an Intel Xeon microprocessor draws 300. And yet we cannot now create an artificial intelligence program that knows how to stack pallets so they will not fall over. And yet this is something that you know, nearly every human, even if they don't have the strength to actually stack the pallets, um, can figure out where they're like, what arrangements are likely to be stable and what are not. I would just add, you know, to sort of put it in another way, um, George was all about rewarding the producer and, you know, yeah. lots yeah. of people who produce who can't necessarily do physical labor. Um, and, and, and he does mention that many places throughout his works. Right. And it's a very William Navarre has a nice quote here from page 334. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
George has a very broad definition of producer. He, he's yeah. talking about anybody who's producing value for the consumer. And that, that can mean moving goods from place to place or storing them to a, to a time when they're more valuable, or it could include things that are not physical goods, but uh, intellectual efforts, uh, a good lecture, a good sermon, a good concert. Um, but these were all producers, and they're distinct from the uh, the beggars and the thieves. Okay, can full scale manufacturing return to North America? Is it possible, or should we be looking to other models for more equitable economy regarding meaningful employment? Um, yes, full scale manufacturing can, and in fact, is um, returning to America. The problem is that, you know, American workers, even at $15 an hour, are live much better and are much more expensive than workers in lots of places elsewhere. And so when manufacturing returns to America, it returns either because the job needs American workers' skills or because the job doesn't need all that many workers at all on the factory assembly line um, that say now that Nike has robots that can actually stitch leather, which was something that was out of the question until seven years ago. Nike is once again building factories in America. Um, the garment industry, the garment manufacturing industry is returning to Los Angeles as increased availability of machinery makes the labor cost of locating in Los Angeles less. And the benefits of being three weeks closer to market, as opposed to producing in Bangladesh and then sending it on a slow boat, you'll grow bigger and bigger. I remember my last tour of the Scharfenberger chocolate factory. There were like five guys on the factory floor. It's not Lucy and Ethel stuffing chocolate into boxes as the pieces come down the assembly line, right, anymore. Um, so that while manufacturing may well come back, you know, the kind of manufacturing that comes back is not the kind of manufacturing that employs a very large number of people. I think we have to look to a middle class income distribution and to our recognition that increasingly we're moving into a service-centered care economy um, because we get better and better at producing goods for humans, but we don't get that much better that faster at providing services for humans. For the future of employment and you know, Bloomberg opinion columnist Noah Smith and I did a podcast on this, I think a couple of days ago. Thank you, Joe Polito for your praise. Uh, uh, George had a um, a utopian uh, streak that came out at times, and um, he he sometimes argued that if the uh, the laboring population was uh, well fed and uh, felt mm -hmm. more secure, that they would they would uh, actually be more intelligent and yes. would educate themselves uh, properly and and would, mm -hmm. would be able to uh, to uh, compete on the basis of, of greater skill and, and ability mm -hmm. uh, re, uh, with, with people from uh, other countries that were very well paid and, uh, and uh, scraping around for a bare subsistence. Um, I, think, uh, I think he's correct in some cases, but I think you can't make the general argument for all manufacturing processes. Okay, we have two questions left. Um, during this era of make it at home, pushed by Trump in the US and by Modi in India, what would be George's thoughts? Um, I think George's thoughts would be that by giving up the opportunity to have each country specialize more in the goods that it had the resources to most efficiently um, produce, you'd be giving up a bunch of potential kind of win-win economic arrangements. And whether it was a good thing for you to do so or not, 
Um, that really depended on how the shift to working at home affected the distribution of wealth and income, which means how it affected the monopoly power of the landlords and the other rich non-workers who occupied choke points where they could collect rents in the economy. That it's very much a generalized theory of, you know, rent um, as a dead weight of all kinds, as a dead weight on the economy, and as the thing that would be avoided. In some ways, very similar to kind of George Stigler's, you know, anti-regulation arguments that he used to make at Chicago in the 1970s and the 1980s, you know, but Stigler developed in Chicago, developed it on its own, and did not refer back to George or at least no one I know of at Chicago after Henry Simons referred back to George, I think in large part because he did not speak native economies. Uh, yeah. George had, had uh, no kind words at all for the argument that uh, we should import only those things that we cannot make at home. He said that's like saying you shouldn't uh, yeah. eat eat any food that you can't, uh, if you can cook it at home or grow it at home, mm -hmm. then, uh, you shouldn't buy it at all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, I mean, he thought of that as one of the, the crudest protectionist ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay, and our last question for the evening, can you expand on how George's definition of monopoly is different than the definition used by many economists? <laughs> Um, but the, there is uh, there is a uh, one technical point, and that is that uh, um, if if land were truly a monopoly in the strict economic sense, the uh, the rent would be much higher than it is now because we do have competing landlords. Um, and, but that's more a difference in usage. I mean, you can you can demonstrate yeah. it. Uh, with 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 the correct uh, demand and marginal revenue curves, but I think it's not a, a very useful distinction. Um, he he thought of uh, when when he was thinking of monopolies, he he often thought of the franchise monopolies. Uh, for example, the uh, the gas uh, distribution companies in the, in the cities. Or the uh, the trolley lines, and I guess you would uh, you would use different examples today, uh, but uh, but that was quite a uh, quite a modern approach. The franchise monopoly is, is indeed one of the monopolies. Um, you know, obviously, you didn't have to deal yeah, with I, Microsoft and Amazon. But. As Bill, as a as a non-economist on this panel, uh, I found the most, um, I guess, the best way to think about the George's view of monopoly was from Mason Gaffney's work, where he talked about its preemption. Yeah. You, know, you think of parking when you've got a parking meter and somebody occupies that space for an hour, and they pay a certain amount back to the community. Well, they're preempting anybody else from using it, so they're monopolizing the space for an hour. Mm -hmm. and, and then they should pay that because there's a certain rental value to that. They should pay that back to the community. Same thing with, you know, spectrum and um, just uh, urban, urban spaces and so on. But I think preemption is an important aspect of the George's view of monopoly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree, yeah. Okay, well, I think we're gonna go ahead and, and close there. Um, I wanna thank everybody who's attended the event and I especially want to thank uh, the editors, Alex, Frank, and Bill for the incredible work that you've done on the series and are continuing to do. Um, I actually received an email from the publisher just before this event about volume five. Uh, so now we're cooking with gas, which is really exciting. Um, and thank you so much, Professor DeLong for joining us. Uh, this was a wonderful presentation and a wonderful event. Um, so everyone, thanks again and have a great night. Thank you very much for putting this out. Right? It greatly deserves to be you know, well read and a critical edition makes it much, much more accessible. Um, Agreed. Agreed. All right, everyone have a wonderful night. Sure. Good night, everybody. Bye, Bye everybody.